I have a confession to make. I'm kind of a data hoarder, a massive one. Since I started making YouTube videos, I've started accumulating so many storage devices with bits and pieces of every bit of content I've ever made scattered across so many drives that I don't know what to do with them. So I came to the conclusion that I needed something to better manage all of the digital junk that I was generating and that I needed a NAS. And because I'm probably not big enough of a YouTuber to enlist big tech daddy Linus himself for a super overkill NAS, and knowing that he'll probably drop something during the process anyway, I'll be putting one together myself. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about my experience of buying a NAS, setting up the NAS, all the cool things I learned you can do with it, and my life with it since then, all from a complete novice's perspective of owning and using a NAS. Let's get started with a little review. This video is sponsored by Karma. First, what is a NAS? It's definitely not related to a wrapper, and it's definitely not tech that's cool at first glance, like a new phone, graphics card, or drone. But it's something that's really cool because of all the features it can provide you. Trust me on this, it's cool, I promise. Or your money back guaranteed, not really. It's kind of free content. A network attached storage device, or NAS for short, is kind of self-explanatory. It's storage that can be accessed over your home network or even away from home with the right setup. Imagine it like your own personal Google Drive or Dropbox, except you're not paying monthly fees, you pay upfront for the cost of the hardware and have to set up everything all by yourself. On a one to 10 difficulty scale, I think this would rank around a six or a 10 because it requires a little bit of techie know-how to get everything up and running properly. But because of its almost DIY nature, you can control how much and how fast your storage is. If you want something small, cheap, and easy to maintain, there's an option. If you want something that makes it look like you're trying to hack into the mainframe of a major corporation, there's an option. But at the end of the day, at its core, all a NAS really is, is a computer with a bunch of hard drives and a different operating system than your usual Windows or Mac OS. All you would need to do is cough up some money and have some imagination to get started. So wait, if a NAS is a Google Drive or Dropbox alternative that I just have to tweak and maintain all the time, why not just pay for those services instead of dealing with all of that? Well, Google Drive and Dropbox, while cheap for smaller storage tiers, can quickly get expensive when you need more and more storage or when you need to add additional users to access those files. It's also limited by the speed of your internet. That determines how fast you can download and upload files. But the benefit there is that there's no maintenance, one monthly cost, and you can pretty much cancel it anytime you want. On the other hand, a NAS is much more customizable. You can control how fast it can potentially be by the connection type between the NAS and your computer or your Wi-Fi signal if wireless. You can control how much storage the machine has by buying a new hard drive and slotting it in. And you can do so much more since a NAS is basically a computer with special software installed. There's even NAS boxes that give you the ability to run your own chat email or document server. You can set up a Plex Media server. You can even run home automation services like Home Assistant and set up multiple users and control who has access to what on your NAS so people can't go snooping through all of your stuff. All that, and there's functionality to back up all the data on your NAS to services like Backblaze for redundancy. All right, I just shoved a lot of information in your face, but my point is there is a ton of functionality built into these boxes that if I were to go through every little detail, it would be a 24 hour long video that I would not be qualified enough to talk about. Downside is just like with everything you own, if it breaks, it's coming out of your own pocket. <laughs> when I'm looking to make a major purchase, I'm the type of person that constantly checks different websites for that product every single day until I see a price drop. As you can probably guess, that's not efficient and wastes a ton of time. Like I've been trying to upgrade my desk setup, right? And needed speakers, but didn't want to pay full price for it. And so I would check the price every single day, which of course is very time consuming. But thanks to Karma, today's sponsor, I was able to look at the price history and get notifications when the price is dropped, saving me money and time on this project. Karma is a free browser extension and app that can help you shop online easier. It automatically finds and applies the best coupon code for you at checkout. You can also plan and organize your shopping by saving items that you like from 50,000 stores to shopping lists. You'll get real-time price updates on items you've saved. You can also earn cash back. Out of all the features that Karma has, my favorite has got to be the wish list function. I actually created a list for all the things that I want in my future desk setup right here. If you're interested, check out Karma's free Chrome extension by checking out the link in the description box below. Okay, you probably heard my data hoarding problem and thought, Jimmy, just buy a bigger hard drive. They can be pretty cheap per terabyte if you buy some of the big chonky boys. And that's 100% true. 
I could just buy this 20 terabyte hard drive and use that until it fills up and then buy another one. But my problem isn't just finding a place to store all of my previous content. Normally, when I edit my videos, I edit off an external two terabyte SSD because a YouTube video project can be around 100 to 200 gigabytes sometimes. And the performance of the SSD is fast. And with the SSD, I can unplug it and connect it to any other computer and continue editing the project. I can't do that with a hard drive. They're usually too slow for my video editing needs. But when that SSD fills up, I do the unthinkable. I wipe it and start all over, losing me all of my precious raw footage, like the one of me getting frustrated with messing up a line. I even wipe out the project files. The only thing I end up saving is the finished video. The reason this is a big no-no is because if I wanted to use an old clip from a video that I did 30 videos ago, I'd have to use only what's been kept in the finished video or reshoot that clip altogether, which is a time-consuming process. A central storage device makes it fast and easy to access old footage that I can reuse in a new video. Like my last video on the MacBook Pro, not gonna lie, there was a lot of reused footage in that. I also don't store my video projects on the computers I edit with because our editing machines don't have four to five terabytes of space and that would be needlessly expensive. My wife actually helps me edit my videos pretty often and saving projects on the machines I'm using means we can only rely on one machine at a time for video editing, which isn't ideal. So the goal of the NAS, number one, is to have a place to dump all of my raw YouTube footage and finished videos. The second one is to have a big and fast storage device that rivals an SSD in terms of performance that we can use to edit YouTube videos for my channel and my wife's YouTube channel. The third one is we need to be able to access our library of video projects, archives, and files from pretty much any machine in the house and when we're away from the house. I still wanna be able to upload and download stuff when I'm a thousand miles away from home. So when it comes to NASs, I had plenty of options. Just like a computer, we could go with either a pre-built system or build one ourselves using off-the-shelf PC parts. But that second option requires more tinkering. Because I wanted something that I wouldn't have to tinker with too much, I decided on the pre-built route. For pre-built NASs, two big names come to mind. Synology and QNAP. Both are fantastic options with different types of trade-offs. Synology is a little more easier to use with a cleaner looking OS, but QNAP usually offers better specs for the price. I decided to still go with Synology since it's my first time putting together a NAS and I needed it to be easy. So the NAS I ended up going with is the Synology Disk Station DS1821+. It's a mouthful, but it's a NAS with eight hard drive bays. Why did I pick a NAS with so many drives though? I would actually recommend that if you're purchasing a NAS to buy one with more bays than you need in the moment because you can always add more drives and it's actually really difficult to get more bays unless you get another NAS altogether or an expansion unit for that NAS. I think a four bay is the minimum I'd consider, but it really depends on what you need the NAS to do, your storage needs, and if it needs to be upgradable. Once you have the NAS, you basically have a computer that's missing hard drives. So I ended up buying four four terabyte Seagate Ironwolves and two WD Red Plus six terabyte hard drives. At the time of purchase, these are what were on sale. I don't care if they don't match. Who's gonna see that? For NASAs, you don't want a random hard drive you ripped out of your old 2013 HP laptop. You want drives that are CMR for NASAs. I don't wanna go into too much details about that. You can Google CMR drives to figure out if a hard drive is CMR, but basically CMR hard drives do better in a NAS than regular hard drives do. And that's what the Seagate Ironwolves and WD Red Plus drives are. Remember how I said this NAS is basically a computer? You can upgrade most NASAs just like a PC. I purchased a 16 gig stick of RAM and a 10 gigabit ethernet card and installed it in the Synology NAS to further enhance its capabilities and transfer speeds. Installing the hard drives themselves were super easy. Just pull them out of the bays, remove the sides, slap the drive on and reinstall the sides. And from there, slide the drives back in. And from there, you just turn it on follow the directions to connect to it, and follow the prompts on the screen like you've set up a new computer. How a NAS functions depends on a lot of different things, right? If you're using hard drives, using SSDs, and the different types of arrays that you decide between. The kind of array we're talking about is just how it's managed. There are arrays that can prioritize performance, parity, or sits in between the two. Basically, each type of array has its own list of pros and cons. For this build, I'm using SHR which is a Synology specific one. It allows me to use drives of different sizes, but the largest one will always be used for parity. In this case, that means I lose six terabytes of storage. But if one of my six drives decide to just die, I will still have all of my data. The system would just need to do a self repair and I can replace the failed drive with a new one. But so wait, earlier I said hard drives were too slow, but I ended up buying hard drives anyway. How does this fit my requirement of needing fast storage? 
Well, basically, these drives are in SHR, Synology's version of RAID, which basically means all six of these hard drives are working together to get the job done. How much of a difference does that make? Well, here's how fast an external hard drive connected with a USB 3 port to my Mac is. And here's how fast the NAS through a 10 gigabit connection is. The difference is massive, especially the read speeds, with similar performance to an external SSD plugged right into my Mac. So the performance I'm getting at the NAS is absolutely fantastic. This is exactly what I expected. But how's my overall experience been? For the last few months, I've had the NAS connected to my home network through a 10 gigabit switch. And now it's become an important part of my home. I can basically access everything on it from my phones, tablets, and computers, either from home or when I'm away. It's really honestly streamed on my workflow. I can even make small edits to video projects over Wi-Fi, which is nice. I didn't anticipate that. Now I have high capacity storage from pretty much anywhere over Wi-Fi or ethernet, just like a Google Drive. But when I'm at home, it's stupid fast, SSD-like and I still have two bays open to expand the setup and add even more storage whenever I need to. This NAS actually has USB ports. So then I did what any logical person would do. I took those drives that I was hoarding and plugged it into the USB ports. The Synology NAS treats it just like any other computer would treat it, as a removable drive. But now every computer on the network can access it. I actually use those as backups for specific folders on the NAS. Always good to have some sort of redundancy, right? So when it comes to completing all of my goals, I would say this experiment turned out to be a success. The NAS has really made this operation much more robust, right? I can upload footage from my MacBook, then edit off the iMac, then export from the Mac Studio for uploads from any machine. What the NAS has become is fast shared storage across all of my machines. I don't need to make sure things are moved onto an external drive anymore. And I don't have to remember to carry that drive around with me anymore. And now, even when I'm far away from home, I can upload footage from wherever I am. But as much as I'm praising it, that doesn't mean that there aren't some downsides to having a NAS. The upfront costs of a NAS, hard drives, and even a UPS in case of a power failure can be massive depending on how much storage and how fast you need the NAS to be. And while I live in a house with my NAS connected into my main network switch, you might live in an apartment with limited space and without ethernet cables running through your home to maximize the speed of the NAS and your landlord may get mad at you if you poke some holes. A NAS is more for a power user and not really the average person. But if you are an average person looking to delve into that world, I think you'll end up being impressed with how deep this rabbit hole goes and what new features open up to you once you start digging into it. All right, I guess it's time for a conclusion. A NAS is an expensive upfront cost for storage. And if you don't need ultra fast or crazy quantities of storage, the Google Drives, iClouds, and Dropboxes of the world might suit your needs just fine. If you have a need for a dedicated machine whose sole purpose is managing massive and fast storage, then I think it's a good choice. A NAS has opened up so many use cases for me as a power user, and I could only imagine how some of the productivity features can be used for small businesses. It's quickly becoming my favorite tech purchase in the last year, and has become the central tech device that I use for my YouTube life and my own personal life. And if you're someone who's struggling with managing all of your data and it was split out between a bunch of different drives just like me, a NAS might be a great solution to look into. Anyway, what do you personally think? Have you thought about getting your own NAS? Do you currently own one? Any tips or advice on my end? How bad is your data management problem? How many times have I said the word NAS in this video? <laughs> Let me know in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And well, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.